I get to sit down. That's kind of cool. Um, well, I, I actually, let me get back here. I was really impressed when you guys did the service up on the North Shore. That really did something to me. I went, wow, I could die now and it's working, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really mean that. I know there's a lot of power in a spoken word, so I got to watch out. <clears throat> but there was, um, and then when uh, uh, three of you came out and dropped off some medicine, who, was that Cooper? Or where? Huh? Anyway, uh, two or three people came out, Emily and Cooper and somebody, and uh, dropped off some medicine last Sunday at the church, and then, uh, you know, because they were bringing it up here, and I thought, oh, thank you, you know, and, and then, said, look, we pray for you, and, I, and there was just really good prayer for my wife, especially, she's going through some sickness stuff, and I went, so the next day, I just called Rick and said, hey, you got a time slot that I could fill in, um, I feel really impressed just to share my story with you guys. And he said, I guess you were working on the schedule because you went, yeah, okay. <laughs> How's this? And I actually thought it was two hours, so I just found out it's one hour, and I'm good with that. Or actually, 45 minutes, don't freak out. And, uh, and so, it, I, but anyway, I can cram it in there. But if I go a little fast, you'll see, you'll know why. And I'm not going to try to get it all in. I'm just going to, like Rick said, do the high, po high points or whatever, you know, and and, uh, but I'm really glad you saw the, the Jesus revolution. That kind of prepared the way for me in a way because I was right in that thing and uh, in a different way though. Here's how, well, okay. Here's the short testimony and then I'll expound on it. I got born, I lived a while, I got born again, I got older and I did stuff and that's it. Okay, now I'm going to give you the bigger version. <clears throat> that's the short one. They say you should have a short one and a medium one and a long one. And by the way, this has a lot to do with my testimony too, you'll see. Um, anyway, help me figure this one out. Okay, I was born and raised in, in a Napa Valley, California, wine country. Easy life, leave it to Beaver if you know who that is. I don't see. I'm mean, I got a 50 year advantage on you guys, <laughs> so I'm gonna say things that you aren't gonna quite get. Anyway, leave it to Beaver lifestyle. We could just do anything, go anywhere, stay out all day, come back home at night, no problem, you know. Good childhood. My, I was raised in a Lutheran church. Um, just my dad, I, they baptized me when I was one, and uh, you know, I know better now, but <clears throat> anyway, they. That's the beginning. I had a good life. And then I uh, got a little bit wild after that. Let's just say jump to the 60s. And uh, then I was just drug, sex, rock and roll. I lived right near San Francisco. Every other week I was at the Fillmore Auditorium and, and bands. I lived with a band. Uh, I was the road manager. I drove the truck for the guys. The amps were as big as your refrigerators, you know, back then. He, and I had to drag those things around, dollies. Anyway, I could go a whole hour just about the 60s, but I'm going to jump that. And the point is, is every year, because this is a 60s, I'm just going to call it the 60s, even though it was like 63 to 73. Um, that's when I really backslid. So I never, ever look, was searching for, for the Lord. I never was searching for some spiritual thing because I knew Jesus at an age like this. And maybe some of you knew him when you were real little, you know. It's like, I mean, I was praying. I have a relationship with Jesus. I, I spent time with him in, when I was in trouble, even my <laughs> drug days and stuff. I had my little Donnie Tofty Bible sitting there, you know, and I'd open it up, stoned out of my mind, and they go, oh, yeah, okay, you know, you know. And the Lord was always there with me, and, but he was always knocking every year, every year, twice a year sometimes. I'd just be cruising along, and you ready? You know, and I go, oh man, no, no, not yet, you know, <laughs> not quite. And so every year it went on for like ten years, and finally, big jump there. I uh, I was on a working in Santa Cruz Mountains on a golf course, and they get rained out every year in the redwoods, so they give us five weeks off, paid, don't have to check in, look for work or anything. And I went on a trip to, I was going to, I used to go to Death Valley a lot. And that's this road, <laughs> take you up to Lake Tahoe and then go back behind Death, Yosemite, Death Valley, a big, long stretch, Mount Whitney and all that. So I'm, I'm gambling all night, probably from sundown to midnight. My dogs are in the truck. Um, I left the 
building. I used to work at Harris Club, so I like that one. Anyway, I left the building with money. I never used to win money. I used to, you know, blow it. <laughs> so I had pockets full of chips. I cashed them in. I got like 500 bucks on me, you know. And I went, wow, this is a good way to start my five weeks off in the de desert, you know. And so I get about over the hill, midnight. I'm driving about an hour down the road, and I'm just happy and everything's going good. And all of a sudden, I get the knock knock thing, you know. Ready? I went, whoo, whoa, and I stopped, and I, went, I went, you know what, I think I am, I'm ready. Because a couple things, I'll, I'll bring it up to this point, but you know there's things in your life that got you to that point, you know, that you can think of them in your head, there's two or three things that ministered to you. One time was, I was hitchhiking to the Monterey Pop Festival, and a bunch of, in 67, and a carload of Sunday school kids, probably on a Saturday outing or something, they, a van picked us up, me and my buddy, long hair and all. You know, you picked up hitchhikers in the 60s. That's kind of what it did. But anyway, these little kids were like busting me for being a doper going off to the big music concert. And they're just little Sunday school kids asking questions, you know, Jesus, you know. I go, <laughs> it was really convicting, you know. Anyway, I got out there. Years later, um, Another big one was I got thrown in jail in Lake Tahoe in 1970. It was a long story, but there was drugs involved in an illegal campfire and uh, anyway, in the El Dorado State Park, which is stupid. So it wasn't my idea, but uh, anyway, my buddy got busted for drugs. I got busted for a campfire and it was 4th of July, Independence Day, handcuffed, you know, and uh, we're, I was there all night in the holding tank. He went off in his yellow uniform or orange suit, and, and I had to go. They were waiting to book me, but for a campfire, they finally lowered the bail to $160. means 10% I had to come up with. That means $16, right? And I go, oh, right. And I, they let me out, and I go to pay it, and I had $15 on me. And I, and I looked at the lady, and I said, hey, can I borrow a dollar? <laughs> she, no way, you know, like... So I looked at another cop and goes, get out of here. You know, this treated me like I looked, you know. And uh, I went, oh, man. And then all of a sudden I went, oh, man, I got, I took off my boot. Under my insole was a dollar bill. And I don't know about Rick, but a lot of us back in the day used to keep a little cash in our shoes. Like a dollar doesn't seem like much, but you could buy hamburger, pack of cigarettes, and two gallons of gas with a dollar, any one of any four of those things. They're all a quarter. So a buck was handy, you know. And so I, I whoa, and I pulled it out. And, it, and you know what Monopoly money looks like about that big. <laughs> it, was all, it was all wrinkled up and shrunk up. And I tried to stretch it out. And I laid it there. And, I, and she goes, you got to be kidding me. Like, <laughs> they almost didn't let me out. But I got out. And, I, and there was, that's number two moments that I was feeling convicted, you know. And, I go, and thanking the Lord. Because I prayed to get out of there. And only Jesus knew that there was a dollar in my shoe. By the way, two years it was in there. You know, it was, I even forgot. So anyway, you're taking notes. You don't probably have to write that part down. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so I'll jump ahead now. I'm, on my, I'm back on the highway going down the mountain. The Lord's knocking. And you got to remember this. What I'm saying yes to is I'm Mr. Cool Hippie Guy, right? You know, let's say a hippie with health insurance. So you kind of get the idea. I'm not like in the gutter, but I'm, you know, I'm okay. And a little pride going there. So I got money. But what I'm saying yes to when I said yes to the Lord was the, the people down in Santa Cruz Mall were these people that, like we call them the Elm Streeters. They were from a, the church on Elm Street. And it was a, just an old-fashioned church, little skinny ties, suits on, and they'd beat a big drum and a Bible about that thick, you know. And they stand on the corner being as uncool as you could possibly be in the middle of the coolest place in the world. And they'd just be singing, power in the blood, boom, boom, boom. And I'm going, wow, how can they do that? You know, they're, they are full-on Christians. So in my, mind, in my mind, that's what a full-on Christian was. Anybody else was just like playing around. <laughs> so that's what the enemy taught me, made me think anyway. So I, I'm saying yes. Okay, Lord, you know what? Okay, I'm saying yes. And that meant I'm saying yes to becoming anything he wanted me to be. I'm, 
I didn't know it at the time, but down the road, I figured, you've heard of that thing where you're signed a blank contract, the Lord gives you a contract, he signs it in blood, and then you sign it, and he doesn't fill it out, because it'd freak you out if he did, right? So I signed that contract somewhere in there, and I said, okay, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm a new guy. And so I got to Yosemite, picked up some hitchhikers, heading it down the road, and I remember going, this is the first time in like 12 years that anybody ever passed me a roach or a joint, a marijuana cigarette, if you don't know what it is. <laughs> and they, uh, sorry. And I, the first time I ever went, wow, no thanks, you know, because what happened to me that night when I repented, I'd already, I was already a Christian, so when I repented of my sins, that was big. I think God was waiting for that. Oh, yeah, one more time. Billy Graham, my dad took me to a Billy Graham crusade, and he said, you want, you want to go up, down? And I go, eh, I got to quit smoking first. And then, so I gave up cigarettes, and that was just prepping me for this event right here. That was a big deal to me. I was crazy. I don't care if you smoke, but I thought that was a big hindrance, you know. And anyway, I get touched by God right then. And I call it the Damascus Road experience for me because I got blasted. And it was the kind of thing where I just rolled the window down. It was hot, windy night, up even though it was a high desert. And I just went, yow, and I'm yelling and screaming and yay, and I'm crying, and I'm bawling, I'm laughing. I am really just a nut, you know. Yeah, I was all alone on this big, long highway. And just crazy. I was going, oh, I just felt the presence of God. And then if I leave this part out, I get busted by God. So I'm going to just share it, you know. A big, important part of my life. I have got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, basically the book of Acts is me in that car right there. I mean, I was... And a Lutheran doesn't know anything about the gifts of the Spirit, let me tell you. Her, those little chapters are missing. And I was just singing in tongues, and I didn't even know it. Like, I didn't even know what it's called. I just had a heavenly language, and I'm yelling, I'm singing, and I'm, like, stoked. And I'm, so I pulled into Bridgeport, California, and it's just about 2 o'clock in the morning, and all I got is $100 bills. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a problem, so I found a little hotel, a little motel, and I went up to the lady, and I go, and I, I looked really high because I was just so happy with Lord, you know. And, and, and I gave her the $100 bill. It's only 65 for the night, or probably 35 I don't know. And uh, she goes, I ain't got no change for no 100 And I go, oh, boy, okay, what do I do? And she goes, you're going go to have to go down to the bar. And I go, now, you got to picture this. <laughs> you saw Easy Rider, anybody? <laughs> okay, this is like that, you know. I go, I don't want to go into the bar, but... I mean, I, there's, it could be trouble. Let's just put it this way. Two o'clock in the morning, cowboy bar, hippie comes in, needs changed. I don't want to buy anything. And I went, I just went in totally free as a bird. I had no fear, no paranoia. I walked in, got the change. It, all, it was all of my attitude. I just waved at the two guys at the end of the bar with their hats on, you know, that could give you trouble. Went back and I didn't want to go to sleep for hours. I waited and waited. I, I just don't want to wake up in the old, the old way I was. I woke up, looked out the window, and I was still there. I was still sunny. Everything was alive. Everything was bright and shiny. I wasn't seeing broken glass and garbage on the highway. I was seeing wildflowers, and everything was just better, you know. And I went, man, I am totally a Christian. So I went home, back to mountains after this vacation, and I, pulled my, I have a Bible under my bed, a uh, big, thick 1890 Bible that I got for a buck or something somewhere. And I, everywhere I moved, I put this under one of my legs of the bed because I didn't have a leg on the bed. So I went, wow, I'm going to pull this out. And I got a board across my chair. Standing on the promises. Huh? Uh, I guess that's standing on promises. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, I was standing on the word of God. <laughs> anyway, I opened it up. And I started with, in the beginning, God created. And I, and I got all the way to Isaiah every day after work. And I wanted to get the chronological thing going, you know, like, okay, the, did Jesus know Noah? I mean, when I, growing up in a church, I didn't know little felt board stickers. You got all the deal going, but you didn't get any connection to it, you know. And I knew Jesus, so he walked on water. Anyway, so I, I, I wanted to get it down. I got all the way to Isaiah. And the reason that board was there, because I had it on my stomach for about a month, and it was just 
killing me. So uh, I got to Isaiah, and then I went downtown to the mall one day. I'm sitting there on a bench, cool place. They played music right down in the Santa Cruz Mall. The guy was playing his xylophone out there in the public, and, and the Elm Street guys were down there beating on the drum, you know, which they always do. And I'm just sitting there on the bench with a, with a beer in my hand, but it was in a bag. And this is the new me. I only had one beer in my bag. <laughs> anyway, so I had some peanuts and a beer. It was really interesting because I'm sitting there with this guy, guy next to me and a, um, a lesbian woman here, a lady. And uh, so we're, we didn't know each other, but we're sitting there. I see these two Christians coming down the road because, you know, you can always spot them even though they might not look like it, but you know, I go, oh, here comes Christians. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, so I stayed there and they came right up to us and the one guy asked this guy next to me, he goes, hey, so you know anything about joy? And he goes, oh boy, and he puts his head down like that. And then the guy lays down underneath him with his head looking up at him, you know, right on the sidewalk. And, and I went, wow, I like this guy. He's right next to me underneath him, you know, and he's witnessing to the guy about joy. <laughs> and then so the other guy, who is a good friend of mine still, he looks at the, um, he looks at me and says, you know the Lord? And I go, yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm all the way to Isaiah, and I knew him as a little kid. I didn't explain that part, but you know the Lord? And I go, yeah, uh, yeah. And so then he looks at this lesbian and goes, how about you? And she goes, and then right then, this guy, Frank, says to Mark, Hey, Myron, we got to go. So I go, oh, okay. So he goes, do you know the Lord? And she goes, no. And he goes, well, he'll tell you. And points at me, you know. And I go, she goes, looks at me and goes, so who's the Lord? You know, and I went, oh. And I, I didn't have it down enough to even answer. I don't, I don't know what I said. I just probably left. I don't know. But anyway, Mark gave me a little card that said Mission Street Christian Fellowship. And I, I went, oh, cool. I, need a, I probably need a church because I'm still doing stuff that's not right, but in moderation, you know. And anyway, I hung it on my visor and took a couple weeks to get there because so many things happened in a bad way that God was just using it to get me there. First week I pulled up, I, I, couldn't, I looked at the people going in. There were people in overalls, um, bathing suits, top hats. It looked like me. Everybody, guitars. I'm going, man. This is cool. But and then I got talked out of it somehow because I thought, oh, all the old straight people are in the back and eh, I burned out. Came back a week later after the worst week of my life. I uh, pulled up, couldn't get out of the door. I didn't realize till, till later that there's such a thing as a demonic force. <laughs> I could not open my door. I finally kicked it open and jumped out and slammed it. Of course, all the people are looking at me like, oh boy, here we go, you know, they, another new guy. And uh, anyway, I walked in the door, um, and this will be interesting to you since you saw the movie, but uh, well, I'll name him. Frank O'Neill was the pastor. He was the guy laying underneath there. I went, oh, that's a good sign. Uh, Danny Lehman gave the message, and he's the head of YWAM over second in command under Lauren Cunningham. That was his third message. He gave an altar call that I came up on. Lonnie Frisbee was our worship leader, and he was... You know, I just thought, oh, that's cool. Good three, those guys are pretty cool. And so when, when, when I got the altar call, I came forward. Lonnie took us in the back room and told us some things. Don't let the enemy rip you off and this and that. Anyway, we became good friends, and he used to come over to Honolulu off and on, kind of recuperating from problems in his life. But anyway, a good friend of the church. Now I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Okay, so at that point, okay, that's me getting saved. That's the first 26 years of my life. Okay, I told Rick I got, I got two parts. That's the 26 and the next 50. <laughs> I'm 76. I'm, I'm 50 years older than you guys. <laughs> it's hard to wrap around that, but I'm really excited because you guys are just like it was back you know, a different place and time, but it's the same group and the same hungriness and the same thirst as that Jesus movement. And you don't want to imitate it, but you just do what God's doing with you guys. And I like it. Anyway, so I'm going to this church for quite a while. I met my wife. We got married. We, I, uh, uh, there was all of a sudden, there was an opportunity. The pastor wanted some people to start a church in Hanalei because he used to go on vacation here. And so he asked Barbara and I to 
be part of that team. So about three family, three couples and their kids came to Hanalei in 79, started Garden Island Christian Fellowship. And before we came, the, there was a prophetic prayer involved with uh, sending us out. And it was that we would become a stepping stone into Asia and the Pacific because we were real missions minded. And it was interesting, we were on Mission Street. And then when we moved off Mission Street to Front Street, we just kept Mission Christian Fellowship, dropped the street. <laughs> anyway, so there was in our blood. And uh, the whole Jesus movement was about the Great Commission. And, you know, the, like I told my daughter, I said, go watch the Jesus movie so that you can find out why you were born in Hawaii. <laughs> It'll explain it better than I could because we got sent out. Okay, so we're here in, in Hanalei, four years, five years, six years, seven years. We were building the stepping stone with the idea of sending people out because it's a real transient place and they're going to go anyway. Most people are here like between six months and five years, average about two and a half years back in those days. So we went, you know what? They're going to go. Let's just send them off to the Asia or somewhere, South Pacific, and see what happens. So that was our goal, like a filling station. You pump up. There wasn't like grandpa, grandma, grandkids in our church. It was you guys, young people, you know. I mean, back at Mission Street, my wife and I were the oldest. The top, there's five of us that might have been 26 or 27. That's, we were older than the pastor. <laughs> Danny was 23. Anyway, Lonnie was probably 22. Um, just to give you a perspective there. So we came to, we got sent to Kauai. We got there in 79, like I said. We uh, built the stepping stone. We had a lot of missionaries coming in and going. And then I started uh, venturing out. And I go, okay, I'm taking my first mission trip. I went to China with a team in, uh, in 1986. And by the way, being a pastor of the church <laughs> was not my forte. That's not what I was thinking I would ever be. On that contract that I signed, that, uh, that, that blank contract, I didn't know I was going to say something like, you're going to be preaching to, you know, Easter sunrise services. You're going to be baptizing people and marrying people, burying people and do it. I go, what? I, I would have freaked out if I'd have seen that on the contract. So I, by then, by now, it's like, Okay, I'm ready to go. I go to mission, I'm go on my first trip to China. It was really radical. It was like 10 days of, I mean, uh, uh, I think that was three weeks, the first one. And I, I, we floated and went on boats and trains all the way to um, Beijing and here and there and doing things all the way, passing Bibles out, smuggling Bibles. And it was really a mind blower trip. In the 80s, it, everybody was dressed the same. They all had the Mao Tse Tung blue and gray uniform, or even their clothes. Women, men, they all dressed the same little hat, no color at all. So nobody spoke English. Um, I got a million stories about that stuff, but time will not let me do that. But then I think uh, that trip, on a, there was one point where there was a bunch of hassles with the rickshaw drivers, like bicycle peddlers with two in each. There was 10 of us on the team. And there was, so there's five rickshaws and it was a big hassle with the money and the hotels and they, they were taking us all over the place in the middle of the night and then they came back to the first spot. We thought they were trying to rip us off, but there we finally find out they're just trying to get us the best deal. <laughs> and it turned out they, this is the best deal. Anyway, that's a, if you ever go anywhere on missions, pretty much know most people aren't trying to rip you off. They're, it's just a matter of communication skills and blowing it. So. We get all the way back. I see the team leader arguing with rickshaw drivers and their wives and about 20 other people. And I went, oh. I said, I went over in the corner. I was going, man, I'd hate to leave it, lead a team to China. Oh, my God. And then right then, the Lord, uh, he didn't, it's not audible, but it was close. It was, you're leading the next team to China. I went, oh. And I almost got sick. I almost actually threw up. <laughs> it just seemed so wrong, but I knew it was God. And uh Sure enough, last minute, I didn't mention that to anybody, but right toward the end of the second year, they were gonna have a team go out. Uh, this is through an organization called Forward Edge. They said, Don, our guy, our guy bailed out. He didn't think they had to go into China with the team. He thought they were just gonna meet in Hong Kong and send them. I go, he goes, can you go? And I go, 
well, let me pray about it. And I already knew I was going, but I didn't want to look like, okay. <laughs> so the next day I called him back. I go, yeah, I, I kind of knew. So I, I guess this is the next point. I, I led 20 more years of that. <laughs> Who would have thought on that contract that it, you're going to go to China 20 years in a row and lead 19 of those teams and five, five teams to Bali and Nepal and Sri Lanka. And I mean, I never would have thought that, but we were the little church in Hanalei is sending teams out all over the world. And I go, wow. I'm going to give you an idea of what one of the teams is like. Um, I mean, one of the experiences. Yunnan province in China is southwest China. Um, it, it borders on Vietnam and Burma, kind of way down over in there. All the big major rivers flow out of that area. And so I used to like to go to the place where nobody was. Yeah. That's why we came here, the uttermost. So we went to the uttermost in China and didn't speak the language. All we had was a written word. And we'd go in there and we'd drive. Went to, the 54-hour train ride was just to get us started. And then we'd start taking buses and van, uh, four-wheel drive stuff. Anyway, they started building airports so we could fly in. And then we could take farther and farther and farther. And we got pretty much up to the border of Tibet. And we were trying to see how we could keep doing this. And um, one place called Tiger Leaping Gorge, if you look it up sometime, it'd be uh, interesting. It's a Yangtze River flows through big high cliffs on both sides. And there's a, the hippie trail that we went through there. And we go in there and some of the, like the Israeli backpackers would, you know, they would bring the least amount of stuff in their pack. They'd drill holes in their toothbrush and so they could get lighter weight. You know, we're, and here we are hug, smuggling Bibles and water and batteries for the Jesus movie and things. Everything we had was just super heavy. So we'd take our time. We'd just kind of walk this 40-kilometer thing, spend 10, every 10 miles or so you'd spend the night. And uh, so I'd go to the same villages every year because I could get in there faster. And then I'd go on to other places. And so every, I'd take different teams in, different teams. And one year we'd be showing the, or we'd be re, giving the Bible tracts. Um, then we brought in the Jesus movie in their language, Chinese. And, hmm? Yeah, Jesus film. And then I get so tired of that. <laughs> I had to repent. Anyway, I, I, we showed it a lot. And uh, it's funny, they took out a few scenes that weren't culturally that fitting, like, uh, I won't get into all that, but it was, it was a good movie and it helped everybody come to the Lord. And I thought it's gonna help, you know? And so one year, I had, in 1998, I brought a guy, I go, look, I've been going in here six years or so to this place. And uh, can you find out if these, anybody here is a Christian? Because we stay with them all the time, we eat their food, we, we help. When we show the movie, we would go, they go, oh no, we can't, we can't watch it. We have to work, you know? We go, oh, we'll do it. So the team would shuck corn and we'd stack hay and we'd do all kinds of stuff. And, and they'd sit, the whole family sit around watching the movie about on a screen this big. And so then I said, I was curious. I go, are they, are they is it working? And he, so he said, hey, are any of you Christians? There's like five or six of them at this one spot. And he goes, she, and they go, oh yeah, we're all Christians. I said, what are you saying? He, go, he said, they're all Christians. I go, what? I go, how, how are they, how, what happened? And he goes, and they all pointed to me, right? <laughs> I go, that's pretty, major evangelist doesn't even know how they got saved, right? They, that's the Lord doing that. So I went, whoa, you know, so I went to three different villages and they said the same answers. They were all Christians and their one guy was, they're still working on it because they know it's a big deal. And he goes, we, we want to all come as a family, but we're still checking it out. We want to make, we don't want to do it half-heartedly, you know? And I go, whoa, that's cool. So I give him more stuff. Anyway, I went, wow, that's, that's working. And I don't even speak the language, but all this stuff you can use does it. And God does it, you know? I mean, you're the only ones in the place. Who's he going to use? You're the only ones there? He'll use you. So I started going, okay, well, I'm going to Tibet. And I had planned on, this, uh, on that same trip to take a week in Tibet. I got in there, visas and all that, paperwork. And then I went, okay, I'm going to do the same thing here. And so then the next eight, I see up until 2005, I was going into Tibet taking teams, which is a whole other thing. And, and that really planted a lot of seeds because there's a bunch of stuff going on there now that I wasn't even aware of. One year we took 
Native, Amer Native Americans in with the full headdress on and the eagle claw and the gear, and they were dancing the, a cultural exhibition kind of thing. And the government people were into it. So we were, instead of being underground with all this stuff, we kind of went to the university in Tibet, in Lhasa, and, and they had sponsored um, oh, interpreters and stuff. So here's, here's the, the government interpreting in Chinese, and then a Tibetan interpreting the whole thing to the Tibetans. And it's all above ground and everything. And uh, they're saying like, you know, here's Richard Twist, he's passed away, but he's got a big feather sticking out, you know, and they've been dancing around all this time. And, and he goes, we follow the Jesus path. And then the Chinese lady said, we follow the Jesus path, <laughs> Tibetan. We and it was like, we were amazed that they were like preaching the gospel and in a place where you're not supposed to do that. It's a lot of the terminology, the Jesus path. They go, well, whatever that is. So again, more literature. One more quick story, and then I want to pass out something to you. Um, on that same thing, the Tiger Leaping Gorge area, I kind of like this one because the, the one guy that had a little, a little uh, beds for rent and made meals. Matter of fact, when you get the bill at the end of the day or two days later, you just keep track. The bed, the, rent, the rental's free. You don't have to pay anything to stay there. But they charge you for food and rice and a Coke. A Coke was 80 cents and the food was 50 cents. You know, big meal. Anyway, real cheap. So he had three daughters, little, smaller, I mean, little kids. I think 10 years old was the oldest, maybe 12. And uh, her name was Lucy. And she, she, I said, hey, I want to give these Bibles. They're, these are pretty cool. They're, they're where they were the New Testament and... A um, bunch of things about starting a church and good quality stuff, you know, made. So she went, okay, so she took me to 40, all 40 houses up the hill. I had to hike to them, you know, and, and if they had a dog, she'd go up because dogs were trained to kill people like me, <laughs> big dogs. And <clears throat> so she passed them out. All 40 people had a Bible. I went, wow. And, she, and they had one on their little bookshelf where the bunch of backpackers keep their bookshelf. You know, sometimes you'll find a half a book. <laughs> Backpackers don't care. <laughs> Read a half a book. Anyway, there's a little Bible sitting there. And I came back the next year. I go, hey, Lucy, how's it going? She goes, oh, the police. She spoke English. She goes, the police came. When they saw that Bible on the, on the bookshelf, they, they took it. And they said, where? You have more of these? And, and they, went, they went to every house and took their Bibles back one year later. Nobody had one and, except Lucy. And uh, I said, oh, man. I go, you need more or are you going to get in trouble? And she goes, no, no, no. Uh, she goes in her room and pulls out her Bible, and it's about twice as thick as when I gave it to her. You know how that gets when you read it a lot? I go, wow, what would you do? You know, you read, you read this a lot. And she goes, no. She goes, yeah, she goes, I read it, but every family came down and borrowed it for a while and read it. They want to know what's so valuable about it that the government would take it. So everybody read it. <laughs> Otherwise, it might just have been sitting in their house, you know. I went, what? And then that's one of those villages that I came back to, and there was people that got saved. Anyway, um, more to go with this. I got a lot of things, but I think I'd, I think I'd just jump ahead another 40 years. <laughs> things are different, you know. When you get older, it's like, you know, you deal with medical stuff. You get, like, I'd go back to Tibet. Uh, a young lady my age <laughs> just mentioned uh, last week, hey, let's go back to Tibet. We can just go slow, get some pack animals, because you know, we've done that before. We did it with yaks going to Mount Everest, and, and you know, that's a whole other thing. But the altitude is just a wipeout when you go to places like that. And anyway, when you get older, you can do some of the stuff. And I always knew I'd be that to deal with. And uh, so it seems like, now my mission, it's like you wake up in the morning and it's more like, okay, God, the Great Commission says, you know, go, but you don't have to go too far. You can go across the street. You can go down to the coffee shop. You can go to the uttermost, Jerusalem, Judea, you know, whatever. And so that really changed for me because I was always going to the uttermost places, the places where nobody went, and I loved it, and I saw a good fruit from that. And then now it's uh, more like open the Bible in the morning and go, or not even open a Bible, just go, Lord, 
you know, I'm going to plan my course and you direct my steps. And I think a lot to do with, a lot of it has to do with um, um, being available and also knowing that uh, there's a whole teaching about as they went. It's on the go. Go is the key word. Like as they went here, as they went to the temple, they prayed for the man. As they, so there's going is the key. You sit home and not going to happen unless somebody calls you or something. So you got to get out there, even if you don't feel like it. And that's where I started doing my new, my new mission now is going off to uh, the coffee shop. <laughs> I'll just get a cup of coffee and sit there. And it almost looks lazy, but it's just like waiting for some kind of divine appointment. And a lot of times it's not going to happen. But if you're willing and open, you'd be surprised, you know. And I'm sure that's nothing new for you guys. So anyway, I wrote up a thing. I got... I got to explain it a little bit. I got time to. I'm going to pass this out, but I'll do it after I read it. It's a. Uh, hmm? We can pass it. Well, I'll just give it to you. You can pass them, yeah. But I'm going to read it first so I don't get sidetracked. It's it's a letter from Jesus. <laughs> I should have. Hope my glasses are here. No, I took a liberty to write it in you know in his name, but you'll get it. It's kind of like based on like the screw tape letters or something like that. Now, it wouldn't be nice if you had a letter. By the way, th I wrote this a different one in this book. Somebody published it, but a friend of mine. I'll leave these here, but there's a letter in here that I wrote, one of the chapters, and it, it's a similar kind of thing, but it's like telling me after a mission trip, if I got this letter before I went on the mission trip, boy, that would have sure, sure saved me a lot of hassle, Lord. So it's an imaginary letter. You'll get it when you read it. This one, um, I put dear blank, so put your name in here. This is for me. Dear Don, now that you are a Christian, I want to explain to you the day, that the day that you became a believer, I commissioned you to go into all the earth and to be my witnesses, witness, making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded. You are now officially on a mission. This may sound very overwhelming and intimidating to you, and I know it's a huge task, but if everybody fulfills the roles I've given them, we will be successful, and yes, I'll be coming back when the job is done. Remember, you were saved by grace to do good works that I planned ahead for you to do. I've also given you the will, the desire, and the means to act accordingly. To make the job, um, to make the job I've given you a lot easier, there are a few things you need to know. First of all, know this. I am with you. The Holy Spirit, my spirit, lives in you now. Think of this as not only having a map, my word, but also having a guide to show you the way. I will be preparing the hearts of the people that you will encounter as you go. I've given you a spirit of adventure, so you'll want to take some risks, risky obedience, as you put yourself out into the deep waters where you will need to depend on me. I want you to just be yourself. Have, you have certain unique gifts and interests along with your distinct personality. I made you just the way I want you. Don't be religious, but be contagious with a mixture of confidence and joy. Have fun with people. Let them see that there's life in what you say. Enjoy the freedom and liberty that my spirit brings. I want, <clears throat> I want you to plan your course, but I will direct your steps. That will take some faith and trust on your part because sometimes there will be obvious divine appointments and other times what may seem like divine disappointments. Be flexible and trust me and you will eventually see the good fruit. Try your best to be aware of my presence. Keep your eyes open and your ears open. Finally, I want you to be intentional. Remind yourself daily that you are on a mission. Think of your entire Christian life as an outreach. Your life on earth is actually a short-term outreach in the light of eternity. Look at each year as 365 short-term outreaches. Today is outreach number 132 for 2023. So be yourself somewhere else. I am with you always, Jesus. He writes really small, by the way. Anyway, I think you get the point, but just be yourself.
somewhere else. That was my short version of the Great Commission. You're now a Christian. You're filled with the Spirit of God. Just go be you. Don't try to be anybody else. Just do, all the stuff that I did in my life is just God giving me the desires of my heart. And some of those things, he put the desires there. And it's always way more bigger than you imagine. It's amazing. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to share some things with these young people. I appreciate what you're doing on, on the earth today, Lord. I, I, there's a lot of negative stuff, but there's a whole bunch of good stuff. And you're, you're at work, Lord. And you're working right here on Kauai, and you're working with these people. So, Father, I pray, God, that uh, anything I've said that um, mistakenly points to me, I, I apologize for that. I point everything good that happened in my life to you, Lord. So we give you all the glory and, and, uh, in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I got one more thing.